nasty. <laughs> oh, I didn't even get it on audio. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Women's Fittest. I'm so excited. Brooke Walker is back with me today, and we are going to talk about competition prep and things that you need to know about and prepare for before you compete. I think this is really going to be geared towards the person who wants to compete um, for the first time and just some things to keep in mind. Um yeah, so I think it's going to be a good one. How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm doing so good. The weather's nice, but it's still cooler here in Arkansas. So I'm I'm ready for like sunny and 70 degrees. Yeah, Bring it on. I'm over this winter stuff. I know. Do you feel like you just would rather live somewhere where it's warm all the time, wouldn't you? Yes. It's like yes. I would rather be in Florida 100% of the time. And, yeah. you know, and I always say this, but like, it's, I would not be surprised if one day I'm just like, you know what, I had my fill of Arkansas, I'm going to up and leave and go to Florida. But I, in all honesty, I do love Arkansas, but I love Florida too. So yeah. it's Arkansas or Florida for the win. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that uh, I always tell myself, oh, you wouldn't appreciate the other seasons if you didn't have this shit that you go through in wintertime. But I'm kind of at this point in my life where I'm like, okay, I'm done struggling now. Like, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't need to get any stronger or experience any more growth. <laughs> I would like some smooth sailing. Thank you very much. No. Kidding. Yeah, like I, I don't have to. I can still appreciate all four seasons without having to experience them. Yeah, <laughs> the nine months that is winter. <laughs> yeah. It's like a pregnant. <laughs> you don't get anything at the end of it. So <laughs> no, I'm waiting for that. What what have I gotten from this? I, you know, really, Arkansas winters are so mild, but I they're way too extreme for me. So having like snow like you guys have, I would freak, I would freak out, lose my mind basically on a daily basis. <laughs> Don't you drive like a Camaro or something too? What do you drive? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's like a drop of snow or ice here, I am like not going anywhere. I'm yeah. stuck inside. <laughs> You'd have to get a Jeep or something. Mm-hmm. Oh, I've had to have people like come get me, you know, in Arkansas, it's hilarious because people will legitimately like drive their side-by-sides, their four-wheelers on the road. So, I mean, I've had people come pick me up in side-by-sides. <laughs> oh my gosh. A little snowmobile action. Yeah. I'm like, hey, if someone come pick me up, please. I'm trapped. <laughs> oh, it's really funny. But, you know, you still get like the cold and the dark, which is really what makes you sad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's like legitimately like a seasonal depression. It's a real thing. Um, and, and I'm all for, I, I do not like the cold weather by any means, but I can handle it if the sun is out, you know, whenever we have these long, dark, gloomy days, it's just depressing. Um, that's also why I would love to go to Florida because it's a sunshine state. It's always beautiful and sunny and everybody's happy there, you know? So, um, <laughs> I, I'm ready. I'm I'm so over it. Yeah. Basically, November, December, January, and February are terrible months for me. And yeah. now March. <laughs> I know, right? It's like never ending. I think I, I need to marry a sugar daddy so that I can have a like a vacation home. A sugar daddy that I don't have to talk to or make contact <laughs> with, or basically somebody who's just sending me money so I can live my best life. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds like the the American dream. Yeah, only in America. <laughs> <laughs> Start doing my feet only fans. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I've got some good feet, so I'm right there with you. I might need to do that. I've had people ask me for some foot photo, but foot photos, so I better capitalize on my feet while I can. Make some money off of them. No. <laughs> I, I just have to say this, and I mean, I'm realizing now too, I, I'm realizing now too, as I get older, as much as I joke about money and finances and whatnot, like, 
it really is like your health really is like the most important thing because I mean, I'm at the age where like everybody older than me is like potentially going to die very soon. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's, it, you just think about like, I just think about stuff like that, but going back to the finances, I just want to say, I saw part of a podcast interview about a girl who was like 20 doing only fans. And she's like, a. I don't, I mean, I didn't know her. I didn't know who the heck she was, but she's like a well-known, like maybe TikToker or something. And she announced she was going to do OnlyFans, started doing it, makes between one and $300,000 a month on OnlyFans. How is that possible? I mean, that is unreal. These are, and then it's like, these are guys like, like every man in the world must be subscribed to her. I don't even know. I, I, I'm More like, power to her. I just thought not true. This cannot be true. I'm, I'm clearly like, doing life wrong. I'm like, you have to solve world hunger, girl. Like you have the finances to. It, I don't know. That doesn't even make sense to me. The imbalance of finance. I'm just like, what? Like, what if you decided to cash out? She's a freaking millionaire, apparently, from OnlyFans. Well, course, you know. sign me up. <laughs> if I'm going to make $100,000 a month, but yeah, sign me up. You mm-hmm. For one month. That's true. That's all I need to do. I'm going to do it one month out of the year. <laughs> but if someone told me I would make $300,000 in one month for doing OnlyFans, would I do it? And I, I wouldn't, but I thought, oh, so tempting. Yeah. I mean, you think about it. I don't know. I might do it. <laughs> if I knew without a doubt, I would make $300,000. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know what she's doing. Like, is this, you know, because the people who do this stuff are always like, oh, you just have to talk to the guys or, you know, or I don't even know if there's any interaction. Like, I don't even know. I would love to talk to her though. I would just be like, I need to know. We need to know the details and I need to see bank account numbers because. Yeah. (laughs) That would be a great podcast, actually. Like talking to somebody that, would be upfront and honest about their OnlyFans. Yeah. I mean, that would be something that would be interested to me. Like, so what do you really send them? Do you talk, you know, is there interaction? But yeah. like, are, is it, I mean, straight, I would, I, yeah. Is it straight up corn <laughs> or what's up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. I want to know. I want to know. <laughs> I want to know. Cause then I could see why girls are doing, but also, you know, you think about too, like how that's you for the rest of your life and you've done it when you're trying to, and you know, that there's going to be whatever you're doing. Those images are forever. All yes. Yes. Absolutely. So it's, it's always, my morals always creep in. <laughs> yeah. If it's going to be a photo, you better make sure it's a good one. Because if it's going to circulate, you, you better be proud. Like, yeah, that is me. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like, oh, some, like, like even like Playboy or something. I like, mm-hmm. you remember how like that used to be like <gasps> scandalous. And I'm like, I mean, I get it that people are naked, but they're beautiful pictures. Yes, yes. So, so. I don't know. That's a whole other, we weren't even going to talk about this. <laughs> Look, we're, we're getting off on OnlyFans and Playboy. <laughs> <laughs> we're just, it's this economy. It's, we're questioning our life decisions. That's the problem. 100%. Yes. We might be in a different um, situation in a few months. Who knows? <laughs> Nothing certain. <laughs> I'm not here to judge. So that's all I'm going to (laughs) say. Oh my gosh. All right. So we're going to talk about before you compete. So I get this a lot. I get um, women who are usually new to lifting. They're pretty. And when I say new, I'm going to be like, I'm going to say like a year or less. 
and then they get it in their head um, be, that they want to compete. And so the question is that I always ask is like, is why? And it's not to judge their answer, but, you know, to get some context. And do you not think that the internet has made it look like competing is really glamorous and easy and like, I'm not saying that, I mean, anybody can compete, but not, but most people will not be successful at it. Like, mm -hmm. yes. What do you think? Yeah, about I completely agree. I think the internet has really glamorized just about anything and everything. Um, and especially obviously from like a competition standpoint. So I think people see the glamour of bodybuilding and in these shows, you get to get all dolled up. You wear this beautiful bedazzled suit. And whenever you do compete, to me, those are some of the best moments of my entire life. Um, show day, you know, it, it's fun. You, like I said, you get dolled up. You're with a group of like-minded individuals who have suffered for 16, 20, whatever weeks um, for that entire prep and everybody's just having the time of their life. And you see that on social media, you know, and that's great. That's a phenomenal time when it comes to comp competing. However, you don't see the weeks, the years that it took to get to that point. You're just seeing the, the, the very vibrant side of it. You're not seeing the dark side of competing and there is a very dark side. There's a, there's a side that's not fun, you know, but in order to achieve that kind of look, that's, you know, you're going to have to kind of do things that the the general population are, is not doing. And that is okay. Um, but yeah, everybody can compete. Most people won't be able to compete um, because I don't think that they understand truthfully how hard it, it is. And, and that's okay. I just wish people would be a little bit more upfront and honest. You know, sometimes coaches are ridiculed for making people eat very little food and do tons of cardio. And I'm not saying that some coaches obviously are detrimental to some people's health, but in the same regard, sometimes in order for you to get in that kind of shape that you need to, you're going to have to do crazy amounts of cardio, maybe eat little food. And it's not fun. I've been there, but if you're trying to look a particular way, sometimes that's what you got to do. Yeah. And I, I think one of the things I want to talk about is how do you set yourself up for a successful prep? But when I ask women about why they want to compete, a lot of times the answers that I'm getting lends me to believe that they're, they're unhappy with their physique. They think that they will get to this look for stage and be able to maintain that look because that's what they want to look like. Um, I do think the internet is getting better about presenting off season and, you know, different body fat levels, but we used to think for a long time, because this is what people's accounts would be only competition prep pictures or leading up when they're shredded, um, you know, photo shoots and that type of thing. And so I think people think, oh, this is what, if I compete, I'll get to this look and this is what I'll be able to walk around and look like all the time. And even people who are like, they're almost are realistic about it. They also think, but maybe I'll be the exception if I'm just more disciplined and um, I'll, I'll be able to do that. I mean, I've had people want to do a contest prep up to their wedding so that they look good for their wedding photos. And I just thought like so many, <laughs> like it's so, like, do you want to stay with your husband? Like he's going to, you know, like you guys not, might not make it to your wedding day. <laughs> yes. Like you're going to be so hangry. You're going to be so grumpy. Your libido is going to be tanked. Your, you know, it's all those things. But, but I always tell women when I start hearing all this information is like, I think you want to have a good, healthy relationship with food. This is what I'm hearing from you. You don't have a healthy food relationship. You're not happy with your physique. You're not feeling confident. And you're thinking that this goal will pre will um, help you achieve all those things. And what will help you achieve all those things is a consistent healthy, um, good behavior choices and that type of thing that you're doing on a daily basis, which actually I think makes you healthy, happy, and com competent or confident right now, rather than 
like something that's going to happen in the future. Because if you are making good choices that you're confident in that are making you strong, that are making you healthy, that are making you feel good, you're going to be happy today and not 20 weeks from now. Yes. Yes. You know, and I think ultimately, like when I'm so glad that you talked about somebody whenever they come to you and they're discussing that they want to do a competition prep and they're interested in competing. And if someone comes to me and I can kind of get some red flags that maybe they struggle with, um, with food at the moment and they struggle with how they look. Um, and, and I think we all kind of struggle with those things, but you know, some people struggle more so than others. And when I feel like there is a legitimate issue where somebody has a, some body dysmorphia issues or maybe some like um, eating disorders, I don't feel like competition prep is the right thing to do for them at that given moment. I think it's very important to tell somebody the stage is always going to be there and the stage is, it's always going to be there. So I think it's very important to establish a healthy um, relationship with food and exercise and sleep and water and all of those things and be happy and healthy with your physique and how you look. Then once you get to that point, maybe you can kind of toss the idea around of competing. Um, and people do have to understand whenever you want to step on stage, it is not overall health and general wellness, you know? So the, the look that you're going to have on stage is not something that is going to be ideal to hold year long, nor should, should you, you know, that's just going to kind of set you up for, for failure from a health standpoint, you know, and then at some point you're going to look back and have some major regrets on what you did because, just you're just not you shouldn't walk around that way um and if you look at these like top level pros maybe they walk around and they have a good physique in their off season and it's a healthy physique and you can look at them and obviously see that they exercise and, and they work out still and they eat they eat healthy and they make good proper eating decisions but they're still heavier their body fat's a little bit higher in their off season than what it is on stage you know and, and if i'm just being honest the physique that i love the most is you know in my off season um because that's that's the time where i get to have those like more of a balanced lifestyle enjoy moments with my friends and family and eat some of the foods that i don't necessarily get to eat during a contest prep however i'm still very active i'm still very regimented i still have a plan that I am eating within my off season, but I'm, I'm happy, healthy. And that's, what's going to set me up for a very good contest prep down the road. Yeah. A, a good food relationship and going into your prep, having been eating in a surplus, I think is really important. Also, we get so many women who have lost a lot of weight. And so they're within striking distance of um, you know, a prep. So maybe dieting another 20 weeks would allow them to step on stage. But if you've been dieting off and on pretty consistently in a deficit for, you know, six months or a year, you, your calories are likely low. And so starting a competition prep at 1600 calories or less is, it only means that you're going to be eating less and doing more cardio, like you said. So, you know, you have to have a maintenance phase. You have to have a building phase probably before you go into doing a prep. And that means it's going to be another year before you. Um, yes. Yeah. Phone call. Are you losing me? Are you <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> like someone's calling me like, don't they know better? <laughs> call me right now. So yeah, you know, but that is so important. All of having all of those phases. If you start at a competition prep, like you said, at 1600 calories, what could you possibly expect is going to happen? You know what I mean? Your calories are only going to drop. You're only going to have to do more and more cardio, you know, whereas if you're starting and you're in a surplus, you can gradually start to decrease your calories as needed based on how you're looking, you know, how your body's, you know, adjusting to particular things. But and then in addition to that, say like, okay, let's say you go through that, that contest prep and then your calories drop to an extreme amount. You're doing excessive amounts of cardio. Then you decide you want to do multiple shows or stay dieted down. It's just, you're, you're playing with fire at that point. You're and your body's going to start to to fight against you as well. So you're not going to look good. You're not going to feel good. And it's just, it's, it's a slippery slope. So sometimes it can be frustrating 
having an off season or seeing yourself a little bit softer at a higher body fat, but every season has a purpose. And I think it's very, very important that you really kind of make sure that you're implying those, you know, throughout your, throughout your entire career, whether it's just for overall health and general wellness, or if you're legitimately looking to compete, I think it's very, very important. Well, and this is why it is important to have a healthy food relationship because you're going to have to be in control in every phase. So when you're in a deficit, you're going to have to be okay with being in a deficit and not thinking about, you know, worrying about binging or, Mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever happens when, you know, when you're in a deficit and then you have to be okay with being in a surplus as well, knowing like, no, I don't want to, I can't diet right now. This is a building phase. Um, and even maintenance is like, okay, well, I want to, I feel like I'm not going in any direction, but that holding phase is also very important to, you know, allow your hormones to kind of reset and hopefully come back to normal. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, just not being hungry and being food focused all the time, which happens when you are chronically dieting, you get very food focused because hormones adjust to that as well there's, there's all these things that are happening. And that's like, to me, and, and, and if I have somebody who really what it comes around to is they have always struggled with body image and their weight because they have a a poor food relationship. If we can work on a healthy food relationship, all the other things are going to fall into place. And you would much (laughs) rather be living, you know, the next, whatever, years of your life, having a healthy food relationship and working on a healthy, happy physique, then stepping on stage, not fixing that, making things worse, you know, looking great for two days and then coming out of it, gaining, you know, I mean, I've seen people gain 20 pounds in a matter of like two weeks and they're, they're devastated. Like this wasn't supposed to happen. And there is literally nothing that you can do except ride it out for a couple of months and allow your hormones to readjust. And I, and I've also seen people really destroy their thyroid. Um, and this isn't even from, you know, like, a uh, like a drug state thyroid, Mm -hmm. um, you know, hunger hormones, um, hormones just get messed up when you're dieting because your body is like, no, this isn't, this isn't how we're supposed to be right now. So there's a lot of things to think about that. I don't know. I mean, it's like telling a teenager, you know, like about life and they kind of have to experience it. You just hope that like you make the experience as good as possible and anything detrimental isn't as, as bad as it could possibly be, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I, completely agree with you it's like you have people and I tell everybody you know rebounding is so important post-show and it's almost like you just related it to a teenager it's almost like they'll roll their eyes at you yeah whatever it's gonna be fine you know and then post-show happens and you just gotta think about it if you have dieted down for weeks and months at a time and you are pushing your body to an extreme where you're doing crazy amounts of cardio, you're super, super regimented on your diet, water, sleep, all of those things are so important when you're prepping for a show, right? And then post-show happens, you're feeling great, you look good, and you go out on this like binger, and all of a sudden, you go from one extreme to something on the complete end of the spectrum, you know, and you were eating anything that you want, you're not doing cardio, you're not training like you should, and you go on this like week long bender. And from the moment you wake up to the moment you're going to bed, you're just eating anything and everything inside your body acts as a sponge and it takes everything that you're giving it, which is a great thing if you're rebounding properly, you know, but if you're not, it's just like you blow up and you feel like literally someone could pop you with a needle and you'll explode. Um, and, and then the unfortunate thing about that is, yeah, it's so detrimental to, to your metabolism at that point. Um, and you could cause some serious issues to your thyroid going forward. You can see that some people will start to try to diet down again and it's harder for them, you know, but a- as bad as this sounds, I almost feel like everybody does have to experience a bad rebound in a sense, because then they know, they know exactly what I'm talking about. And I mean, I've, I've had bad rebounds too, you know, so 
whenever somebody or a client has a bad rebound, I'm like, I told you, I told you not to do that. <laughs> and then they, they know. Um, but I just think that that it's very, very important to, to have a coach that's going to help guide you. And they're going to be honest with you, you know, especially post-show because that's, that's just as important, you know, you, and plus you've worked so hard for weeks and months at a time. Why would you want to just destroy all of that hard work just so you can go out and binge eat on some snacks that are always going to be there? You know, those snacks aren't going anywhere either. <laughs> yes, it's so true. Um, I was going to say something about the, about the rebound. Um, Mm, I don't remember, but you know, getting ready for a show, I feel like I was thinking about this earlier. I kind of, I like analogies and I feel like it's kind of like going on a trip, like you're going to hike a mountain. And if you go to hike on this mountain and you don't have all the supplies you need, like you wouldn't start out with no water and no food and not having had enough sleep and um, having run a marathon the day before, like you have to be well supplied before you you climb this mountain and it's going to be very difficult and arduous and you know everyone says you know enjoy the journey which i think is really true like people who like doing tough things enjoy that struggle but you're going to be at the top and you're going to enjoy that view for a day or two and then you're going to have to find your way back down the mountain again and you want to make sure that you've had enough supplies and everything to make it through this whole trip and come out happy but the trip the, the goal isn't the destination at the top it's to make it through the whole trip all the way back down again yeah absolutely that's i'm going to steal that analogy that's good <laughs> Or like, oh my gosh, I've never heard anything like that. That's that's a great way to put it though. <laughs> Perfect. So so we talked about this a little bit. You want to have um been in a caloric surplus or building, like this is it too. I think a lot of women diet and they start losing body fat. Hopefully they're, you know, lifting weights and that's kind of what got them into the bodybuilding stage of things. And so they're starting to see muscle. Um, but if you are dieting even at the beginning of a, like, if you're lifting weights and dieting to lose weight for like the first time in your life, I'm not saying that you won't maybe build a little bit of muscle, that there won't be some sort of recomp, but you're revealing muscle at that point that's there. And it likely is not enough to present on stage as like, like you haven't built muscle. You haven't been in a stage of building muscle for a competition. And we know that a prep is actually, that's the stripping away of the body fat. Like you have had to build the muscle prior to going into prep. People always think something happens during that prep that you're building muscle, but it's just being revealed. So if you haven't previously built muscle, there is not going to be a whole lot to be revealed once you step on stage. Yeah. And it, people really struggle with that idea. Um, there's going to be a very small percent of people that like grow into a show, you know, like if you're that genetic freak and that happens to be you, then that more power to you. That is awesome. And that's fantastic. But most people are not going to fit into that category. So if you decide that you're going to do a show and you have not built anything, all you're going to do is step on stage and be, be skinny. You know, and that's not what you want. Um, I, so I think it's very, very important to to look at you and be realistic. Um, look at what your starting point is. What is your foundation right now? Would it be smart for you to go ahead and pick a show and begin this process to diet down and, and compete? Or would it be smarter for you to, you know what, let's take a step back. Let's focus on some growth and development of the muscle. And then, you know, maybe let's see what I can do in a year or two's time. And then maybe at that point I can reevaluate and decide, okay, I'd like to go ahead and start a competition prep. Um, and, and you know, with that being said, nothing's permanent. So the nice thing about competing is you can always go up or down in divisions to, depending on what you look like, how much muscle you have, what your personal preference is. You know, some people obviously are going to be more inclined to do different divisions based off of maybe that's the look that they like. Um, and then maybe some people are just going to be more inclined to do different divisions based off of the amount of muscle that they have 
and how maybe they're beginning to grow and develop, they might naturally have to go to a different division, you know, but um, crossing over is huge now. And I think that's an awesome opportunity for people that maybe if you fall on that line, you're very, maybe you prefer a figure, but you're kind of more bikini at this given moment, you can always cross over. And, you know, these judges at the, at these shows, they're going to be there to help you. So if you have questions, you should always reach out to those judges and ask them. They're going to tell you if you're going to be more successful in bikini or figure or what division you should do. You know, it's really tough because things have changed so much, whereas it used to be somebody who hadn't done a whole lot could step on stage and actually do okay. And I feel like the level of muscularity is so drastically different than it was five years ago, especially 10 years ago. And I know a lot of women would always be like, oh, well, bikini has the least amount of muscle. So I'll start with bikini. But it, it's like, do you have incredible glutes? Like that's, you know, a bikini shape is a very young looking body and it's very, you know, but to say you're going to start with figure, a figure physique is very muscular. So it goes back to, I feel like the standards are even higher now for someone saying they want to compete. I'm like, you don't understand the level of muscle that you need to have in order to look like you fit in up there. Um, and I guess this would lead me to like, my first thing is like, what do you know about the sport? Have you been to a show before? Um, what, what got you thinking that you wanted to compete in the first place? Was it social media? Are you in a gym that has a lot of competitors? Have people been asking you, do you like, are you going to compete? Cause that kind of is an indication as well that maybe you should, maybe you would do well if people are actually asking you, but if you're like, Oh, I'm going to do a show and people are like, Oh, <laughs> you know, that also might tell you, Hey, maybe you have a little bit of of work to do. And I'm not saying that you can't get there, but I think people don't understand the amount of time that needs to be put in prior to stepping on stage. And that means following a, um, you know, a training pro program for, mm -hmm. I mean, I like to tell people you should be tr following a training program and a, a diet that is at least in maintenance, if not surplus, for a year before you step on stage and put in that time, you know, cause in the long run, a year is not going to make that much difference. Um, you know, mm -hmm. if you do a prep this year, if you do a prep next year, um, but it could make all the difference in how you look when you step on stage. Yeah. You know, and that is so true. I think right from the, the very get go, if this is something that you're potentially thinking about doing, you know, you need to a, just like you said, go to a bodybuilding show, go watch one, see how they are ran, look at the different divisions. Um, there's plenty of YouTube videos too. And I will always tell people go and watch YouTube, you know, go look at an NPC prejudging NPC final show. And I'm not just saying this, like, it is very, very important. You might think that you want to do something. And once you kind of look at it as a whole and you kind of take a plunge and see what it's all about you might not necessarily want to do it or you might be more inclined to do it you know you're seeing this and you're like oh I think that this is something that I want to do um but you also need to take a step back and think what do I want from competing what are your goals right so if some people will take a step back and you obviously know this there's tons of people they want to go they want to do their first show they want to then go and turn pro, then they want to be on the Olympia stage, you know, and I admire all of those goals, you know, but it takes time. And I think people really struggle with that, especially Americans, like our lifestyle is we want quick results, we want it immediately fast, and we want, we don't want to have to do any work, you know, and the unfortunate thing about bodybuilding is it just takes time and you have to be patient. And this is, and I keep referencing bodybuilding, but I'm just saying, any division, whether it is bikini or if it's all the way up to women's bodybuilding, you have to be patient. It's going to take a lot of time. You're going to be eating the same foods over and over again. You are going to be doing similar exercises and workouts over and over again. So it gets redundant. And I think people get frustrated and you might be busting your butt and seeing little results, but 
you know, from a, especially a woman standpoint, it's going to take us time to build muscle. So it doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong. It just means that you have to be patient and you have to continue to stay on plan and, and focus on the goal at, at your end goal. And I mean, I've been doing it for years myself and there's still things that I am focusing on and trying to get better at. And I'm leap and bounds better than what I used to be, but there's always still room for improvement. And I take a look back, the same exercises that were introduced to me at 12 years old, I'm still doing them now and I'm 33, you know? So literally years. <laughs> yeah, my word. it is, it is. And I, I feel like what, like, I don't want this to be like, this is your warning because I feel like it it can come across a little bit negative for people that are listening, but it is a, it's a huge deal. It's not, um, there, like we talked about, there's a lot of good that can come out of it, but I mean, doing one show again, it's like, what is your goal with that? Like, are you, you know, trying to get some confidence or trying to feel good about yourself? There's a lot of things that you can do to feel good about yourself and gain some confidence. And I, I feel like too, it's kind of ironic because the women that I know who, who like I see in the gym, who look great, who are consistent with their training and everything, like I'll, I'll be like, oh, are you competing? And they're just like, nope. Like they're just happy, healthy, mm -hmm. living, uh, you know, being consistent, living a bodybuilding lifestyle in a physique that they're happy and healthy with. But I feel like it's the people who are not happy with their physique. I think sometimes they think a bodybuilding competition is going to um, expedite me to this physique that I want to have. Um, and not realizing that that physique that you want to have is created like these other women who are just like, I just go to the gym five days a week and I love training and I eat healthy and that's how it, that's how it happens. Yeah. It, it's not as, um, it, it's not as, um, what's the word glamorous. It's not as glamorous. <laughs> it's not as glamorous. It's boring. <laughs> it, it, it's a boring lifestyle. Like I said, I mean, everything, but it, keyword is lifestyle. It is a true true lifestyle and I think people they don't see it that way they see it as oh and we have to do this for x amount of weeks or months and then I'll get this physique and I'll be able to maintain it for the remainder of your life absolutely not that could not be that is not going to ever happen you know you it is very very routine you get up in the morning you eat breakfast and then every three hours or so you're eating your scheduled meals it doesn't matter if you're prepping for a show or if you're not prepping for a show you're just doing it for general health and wellness it's a routine that you follow every single day you know 80 percent of the time you're, you're doing the same things over and over again you're making sure that you're you're being mindful of your sleep you're mindful of your water intake you're mindful of taking proper rest days and recovery days to help you know those things are important too um but people just don't want to do it sometimes and i don't think they understand that it just takes a long time to do it and I never want to see negative because I, I love competing. I love the sport of bodybuilding. And it's something that I want to be involved in for the remainder of my life long after I actually retire and stop competing. Um, it is one of the most rewarding feelings that you will have whenever you do step on stage because anybody can help you and you can have a whole army of support there that is going to be there for you every step of the way. But there's only one person that can actually do the work and that's yourself. So Whenever you are able to get on stage and you have spent grueling hours on that step mill and you have cried whenever you're doing the leg press because you're so tired and you feel so weak and nothing's going your way and you're eating cold fish or chicken and that out of a Ziploc bag. Um, it is so gratifying whenever you get on stage and you're like, I did it. You know, that is, that's a major win and a major victory because it is challenging. Um, so I think that, I will always tell people, absolutely go for it. I want people to compete. I think they will love it. Um, I think they experience everything, the entire prep, then show day. That is all something that I love personally, every bit of it. So I, I know how happy it makes me. So I want people to be able to experience that same happiness, but just be smart, you know, be smart. And like I said earlier, the stage is always going to be there. So maybe if right now you're not quite ready, that's okay. 
you can still go to these shows and watch them. You can still train as if you want to compete and still eat as if you want to compete. Eventually there's tons of uh, NPC workshops that are now offered everywhere. So you can go and take part of those uh, and see some of these, these elite pros and some of these head judges and things of that sort and ask questions, you know, um, that's what they're there to do. They're there to help you and help kind of guide you and lead you in the right direction. But just because you're doing those things doesn't mean you have to necessarily compete right now. Yes. This is like an opportunity for you to learn anytime that you become sort of passionate about some something, know that you're going to invest time in it and learn from all different aspects. So like you said, going to shows or, you know, I mean, we always talk about like when the Olympia is on or, you know, a couple of the pages that you can follow on, um, on Instagram will show you the, like the pro shows that are happening around the country and around the world. And you can sometimes watch some of those on pay-per-view. So, you know, go to, you know, if you want to support the Arnold, go to, go to, the, go to the Arnold, um, you know, but go to even a local pro show, you know, Anna and I went to see you in St. Louis back in, in 2017. Yeah. 17. Yeah. Yeah. 2017. And it's just, I mean, seeing a pro show is night and day different than watching, you know, a local show. I was going to say too about a local show, you can always go to NPC News Online and see like who the winners were. And you just kind of, you can take a look at their stage shots. And if you're doing this, look at your progress pictures and kind of see how do you compare with the people that were in the class that you might be competing? Are you going to look like last place or, you know, do you have a shot to be in that, you know, that top five or whatever? So um, I just think it's really important for people to try to educate themselves. You know, like you said too, YouTube videos, follow the pros on Instagram, follow some of the local NPC competitors that you know on Instagram, follow um, um, some of the judges. Uh, Fit Pro Becky is really great to follow. She always talks yes. about, you know, the different classes and how they're presented every year and what kind of has changed. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about is I think part of the reason why sometimes I think a lot of women, especially at the beginning, want to step on stage is they're looking for some sort of validation and a little bit of a place to belong. And I am speaking totally from experience. I know I stepped on stage the first time um, and I actually did what we were talking about. I was getting ready to do a show. Um, I wasn't going to be big enough for women's physique, which is what I wanted to compete in. And that was in 20, it was right around 2013. So you know, I took almost another year to work on building, probably added another five pounds because it was in the um, five pounds muscle because that was the beginning of my <laughs> lifting. So it comes pretty quickly at the beginning there. Um, and then I stepped on stage in 2014. So I did have a like a, a mock prep that didn't, you know, didn't come to fruition because I, I wasn't going to do well. And then, you know, and then it worked out very, very well for me. But I was also going through my divorce at the time, um, or not too long after, and just trying to find myself and figure out, you know, who I was and where my life was going and all those things. And I think a lot of us come to crossroads like that. And then we decide we're going to, you know, run a marathon or we're going to, you know, do a play or, you know, something, you know, something that is going to, help us with that, that change in direction that's going on in our life. And I, I don't think that's a bad thing, but finding, you know, just finding bodybuilding in this community, you don't have to be a competitive bodybuilder to like fit, to fit in. And I know even as somebody who's retired, um, I still, you know, have the respect of you and a lot of the other women in the industry who are like, you know, Deb never competed at our level, but she still trains hard and is still living this lifestyle. Like we're all part of it on whatever level we're at, you know? It, it, that's so important to me because I think it, there's some people that just love bodybuilding and they might not ever have the genetics to ever make it to the, the pro circuit. And that's okay. 
But something that I do love within our community is there's there's a mutual respect. It doesn't matter if you are a first time competitor or you are literally the best in the world, you know, everything in between that there is a mutual respect because this this lifestyle is hard, you know, and it, it is very, very challenging. There's lots of long, lonely times within um, this sport where, like I was saying, it, the only there's only one person that will ever be able to get you through this, and that that's you, right? So you can have an army of support, and I hope and pray that every person does have that support and that backing whenever they are prepping for a show, because that is important. But the one person that has to implement everything is it's you, it's yourself. So man, it gets, it gets tough at times, you know, and there's not going to be anybody that's going to wake you up at 4am to do that faster cardio and do it for you. It's you, you know, or if you're having to stay late at the gym and get your post training cardio done, I mean, the hours of posing and just, there's one person that can do it and that is yourself. So there's this mutual respect between every competitor, whether you're male or female, whether you're a bikini competitor or bodybuilder and everything in between. And that's what I love about this sport because everybody just gets it. It's very rare that you're going to be in a room with like-minded individuals, but whenever you're, you're there competing, you have to soak that up because that's only going to happen a few amounts of, you know, few times a year. And that's like the, be the best time of my life. So I, I obviously love getting on here to be able to talk and communicate with you because you understand, you get it. We have this mutual understanding. You've been through it. I've been through it. So there's just this, this respect and this friendship that's been established. And I'm just forever grateful for that. Yeah. That makes me cry. <laughs> <laughs> It is, it's true though and I think there that's just kind of it I know I know a lot of women who are also you know they're a different like maybe they're around my age things happen uh -huh. they're out of the house they're thinking about what's next um I do know some who don't have the support of their husbands and that is awful and I'm you know I'm sorry about that but yeah we always have like this group and I I feel like even you know, a lot of the pros on Instagram, if you reach out to them, they're, they'll respond, they'll give you some direction, they'll give you some encouragement. I mean, like you said, whatever level somebody's at, they're still a real person and they still started where you're starting and they still understand and feel all of those same emotions, same emotions and have been through where you're going through. So, um, it is. It's just a beautiful, it's a beautiful community. And, and if you do compete, like you said, Brooke, you will experience that camaraderie, somebody fixing your suit backstage, somebody running to give you another pair of earrings because yours broke, um, you know, fixing a heel. Like it's just, you know, Oh, I have hairspray. I have this makeup. Um, you know, that type of thing. The women are like, you, you know, it's like, it's like the adage of the, like the drunk girl in the bathroom and it's like, oh, I'll hold her hair. I'll make sure that guy doesn't come in here. I'll just, like, everybody's just stepping up. Is that is so true. So true. Um, you know, at the Olympia, I needed a bobby pin. And so I'm like running around backstage. I'm like, does anybody have a bobby pin? You know, and it, it's just nice because it is, everybody is there. They get it. The people that you're competing alongside, they are there to help you, you know? Um, and I just love it because you do have these relationships that are established that you still talk. I mean, I talk to so many girls right now, you know, and they're, they're my fellow competitors. You know, at the end of the day, we're stepping on stage against one another for this battle to, to win, you know, but we're also cheering one another on and we're talking about the experiences that we're going through, just whatever, how, how's our prep, how's your off season, and that's what I do love because you have lifelong relationships that just truly you'll cherish forever. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that like, this is why it's important to, when you start living this lifestyle, you start to have a better relationship with your, you know, mentally with your physique and with food and everything else. And it just puts you in a better spot to be that type of person around other women, to be encouraging, to not be jealous, to be able to look at somebody and say, 
oh my gosh, I wish I had legs like that, but I don't, but she inspires me to, you know, <laughs> squat a little bit harder or whatever it is. So I do love just getting involved in this community and it plus like, like you said, I don't think competing, competing, especially chronically is not healthy, but I think what, what a lot of us want to be is healthy and you can find that level in there and be in that group and be a part of it. So yeah. 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 Um, what else? Okay. So, um, we talked about a lot of these things. So, um, oh, so I want to talk about body fat levels a little bit because this is something too that like we know having been doing this for a long time, you really can't measure body fat because people always be like, oh, what was your body fat percentage there? And it's just like, um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like the number, like the number doesn't matter. We're going for a look here. So, you know, so, I mean, straight up, like you can't measure someone's body fat percentage, um, correctly, like perfectly, unless they're dead, really. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So funny. all these machines, um, you know, but you can use calipers and like yeah. do skin fold sites and track that way, just not for the number percentage, but as a benchmark, you know, if you have a tricep skin fold, that's six, hopefully in two weeks, it's at five and, and so on. So mm -hmm. you can use that as a tracking method, but not to say like, I'm 12% body fat or I'm 8% body fat because that's not, it's not accurate. Like <laughs> it's not cool. <laughs> you know, and, and when it comes to body fat, I personally never track my body fat percentage because I just go based off of a look, right? I can clearly look at myself and say, you're where you need to be or no, you're not. <laughs> but in, in that same regard, I think that's person dependent. If you want to track those things for, for your own sanity, I think that's fine. And I think it's another method for you to be able to track and monitor progress. However, like you're saying, those things, a lot of these like in-body scans and things of that sort, they're not necessarily the, the most accurate tool. But yes, can you use them? Yeah, and you can. But just be mindful. You might not necessarily be a true 12% body fat. And here's something else to consider too. You, somebody... You could have two people that are the same height, same, same weight, and their body fat is the same, and they could look totally different because there's other factors to consider, you know, how much muscle do you have? Somebody that has a little bit more muscle is going to probably look totally different, um, which is fine, but you just have to be realistic with that um, because I assure you, I've heard so many different people say their body fat's like something unreal, and I can look at them and say, mm, no, it's not. <laughs> it's not that you know? Yes. Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause I was telling, uh, like my daughter, she, she weighs about 15 pounds less than me and is tiny. You know what I mean? So, and I'm like, well, like I have a lot more muscle than you, you know? And I'm like, I just look so much bigger than her because she's just, you know, but it's like, it's only 15 pounds. So like what you're composed of makes a huge difference with like how you look. And I, and like you said, Brooke, I know that I have this with clients too. The only thing that we do for the most part, I mean, anything they want to do is fine, but I have scale weight, which I usually only have them weigh themselves once a week. Um, and we just measure it trending. Some of them will weigh themselves every day. Um, that would drive me crazy. But if they want to do that, that's totally, <laughs> that's totally fine. Um, and then we do pictures with check-ins because like you said, I can, I can tell by looking at you where somebody needs to be, but where it was going with this, as far as body fat percentage, people will be like, well, what body fat percentage do I have to be at in order to begin my prep? And it's like, it's not that it's a look and likely you're going to think that you have less fat to lose than what you have to lose. Cause I think the main thing that people don't realize is by the time you start looking good, you're about eight or 10 weeks out <laughs> and you still have like, it's like when you look like walking death is 
because you regardless of the category like pretty much all the body fat needs to come off mm -hmm. yeah yeah every division is is lean yes. you know what i mean like I, and so you can't discredit one division and say that one division is easier than the other because it takes a lot of hard work, no matter what category or division that you're you're competing in. Um, so I think really people, there's no like set guideline. Like you have to be X amount of per percent of body fat to compete in this division. Um, it's person dependent. And I think something too, that's very, very um, important to note on is you might see some girls, they might be in the, the bikini division and they might place well, and they might be a little bit harder or more conditioned than some of your other bikini competitors and, and vice versa. You might see some girls, they just pull off maybe a softer, rounder, fuller look, and it looks good on their physique as a whole. And at the end of the day, you have to think about it. These divisions are, yes, obviously the more conditioned, the more muscle that you have will kind of depend on what division you're in. But how you carry that muscle in your overall presentation and package, it's an overall look no matter what division that you're in. And I think that's something very important to take note of, note of and make sure that you understand that. It's not somebody, just because you have the best glutes on stage doesn't mean that you're going to win. You know what I mean? Yeah, you could have the best glutes, but somebody else might be the winner because her overall look, her overall package is just the best overall package that's on that stage. Yeah, well, and a good lean into that would be to talk a little bit about posing. Um, I want to say that. Um, so I'm. I have a, a interview with Autumn Cleveland next week, and she's gonna. We're gonna talk all about posing because she really has kind of made a name for herself with helping people out with posing in all the categories. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited to talk with her, but I do want to touch on this a little bit because I feel like it's probably the number one overlooked thing, don't you think? At 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Posing? Go ahead. You go. No, 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 you take. You start. <laughs> well, I just was going to say, like, I've seen so many girls, girls, is, I mean, I, I notice it with the guys do, but girls will step on stage and it's just like, you could have placed so much better or just even your stage shots could have been so much better if you had spent more time on posing. It just yes. is just what comes to mind. And to me, what I think of is when you look at somebody on stage, nothing should look weird. Like if anything stands out weird, it was not corrected with your posing. What you want to mm -hmm. just look at somebody and go, oh my gosh, they just look like a total statue. Like they just look, mm -hmm. nothing should be standing out as looking awkward. So that's like my, that's what I think of first when I think of with posing, you go. Yeah. And here's the thing. I think it goes back to, you know, we both kind of have discussed that you should go to a, a show, a bodybuilding competition, because even if you're not familiar with the, the divisions or the posing, you know, what's pleasing to the eye. So you can see these competitors walk on stage and you know, oh my gosh, they have this great overall flow about them. They look very confident on stage and their posing's on point. And then you see it, the next competitor that comes on stage and you just know, you might not know what's wrong, but you know, something's not right because there's not a good flow there. Um, so I, I think it, obviously you have to set yourself up for success and all of these things are so important. So you might have the best physique on stage, but if you don't know how to present that physique, you might not win. Um, and at the end of the day, you can't be upset and you can't call politics or whatever the case may be. And competitors are going to do those things, unfortunately. But you have to be mad at yourself because you didn't present your physique to the best of your abilities on that stage. So if you're not practicing something like posing prior to you stepping on stage, that, that that's a big, big mistake on your end. Um, there's tons of posing coaches that will be more than happy to help. NPCnewsonline.com has great options there and great videos for you to actually do proper demonstrations of posing. Um, in addition to tell you what are your mandatory poses, because your mandatory poses are going to vary from division to division. So if you're not looking at those things and you're not taking it upon yourself to make sure that you're checking off all the boxes, you're 
you're not going to be very happy with how you you place come show day and then you're going to come off stage and be like I have no idea what I just did and it might be something that you would have actually loved but now you have this bad taste in your mouth and unfortunately you might not ever do it again um so set yourself up for success make sure that you know the division that you want to compete in make sure that you know how to pose within that division look and if you don't know how to look find somebody that can help you and lead you in the right direction yeah well this is why another reason why i feel like it's important to put time into like your training because it it causes you to have this body awareness as you're connecting with different muscles. Like I can look back at some of my old training videos and like I'm doing RDLs and it's like, uh, 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 you know, like it's, it's crazy. Like how fast, like I'm moving through stuff. Like I'm not connecting mm -hmm. with the muscle. I'm like, you know, point A to point B, like how quickly can we get this mus this, this uh weight moved or whatever. And when you start to like, really learn how to connect with your training. You also are connecting with your body when you learn how to do, like, I don't care what division you're in. I think you need to learn how to do a lat spread because it helps you connect with, you know, another connection with your body, with those muscles. But, you know, all of this time contributes to body awareness, your confidence and, and, things that are going to allow you to present yourself better on stage, even just like sharing your journey on social media, you know how to take good selfies, you know how to pose your, I, people make fun of like, you know, selfies, but I'm like, okay, but like, it also helped me with my posing because I know what looks good and what doesn't look good on my body. So there is a, a vanity element to this all. It's really very self, 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 but that's what you need to have in order to present yourself well on stage is this self-awareness. Yeah. You know, you absolutely have to, um, posing is so it's a different form of training, you know, just like you said, like there, you have to be in tune with your body because you can go to your, your local gym or at your house and you have um, a mirror that you're posing in front of. And that's great. Use those. You know, I'm not saying don't use a mirror, but come show day, you're not going to have that mirror. So you need to be completely in tune with your body. That way, whenever you're on stage hitting those poses, you know, without a doubt, this feels right. I know I'm hitting this pose right. Um, so use those mirrors, yes, but get to the point where you're able to eliminate them and, and post without a mirror. I always tell people, myself included, I will set my camera or my phone down low because, you know, judges are going to be down. They're going to be sitting sitting and looking up at you. So I think it's very, very important to get um, a judge's perspective of where they're going to be sitting um, and pose in front of a video. You know, you can do I pose in season, off season. It doesn't matter. And obviously, sometimes I don't like to pose like right now. <laughs> But I was still going to, you know, because it helps me. It's a different form of training. And the more often that you pose and you hold those poses, it's going to actually bring out some some of those fine details that you're going to look for and want to have come show day. So posing is important. There's a whole nother art to that. Um, and it's often overlooked and it never fails at every show I've ever been at, every show I've ever worked. There's a competitor on stage that I am like, mad at because I'm thinking they look incredible and if they would have just fixed their posing it would have made a huge difference for them and they would have placed higher so yeah make sure you don't want to it's like if when you take that video whatever looks awkward to you is going to look like awkward and and here's the other thing too and I don't mean to sound like um like you're making it awkward for everyone but like it people enjoy the show because the people on stage mm -hmm. are having fun and then the and then you have like the MC who is like it's so it's like a triangle of good times that are happening so when you have somebody who's like super awkward everybody's like cringy because they're like they're feeling sorry for this person and it's just it's like a weird you know what I mean so like you're 
you're making the whole show amazing when you put in all the work in all areas that it takes in order to step on stage. I think. Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Um, you know, there's something that I was going to mention that um, I, I just wanted to, you know, with talking about like, um, I want to talk about coaching a little bit, but um, so Nicole Wilkins has, and we all know and love Nicole Wilkins. Like we just, we just love her. Um, she has a page on Facebook that is like a group and she does like challenges and all this stuff. And I feel like for someone who, I think sometimes people get sticker shock when they go to hire a coach. Cause they're like, Oh, it's like, you know, at least $150 a month for a good coach. I'd say you're looking at 150 to $300 a month for coaching. Um, and that's just like online. Like that's not even like, Oh, you get to meet with your coach and train with your coach and all that type of stuff. So I, I just want to promote this. Cause I know this is a, this is an episode that's going to be, um, watched by a lot of women. If you are looking to start somewhere and you know, you don't want to like invest in coaching and you have struggled with like a food relationship or something like that, Nicole Wilkins does these challenges. She writes a training program and provides, um, I actually purchased one because I wanted to kind of see what was going on. And it was actually very helpful for me. This was a couple of years ago when I was starting to like really think about, oh, I really need to work on my food relationship because I'm still like good food, bad food. And it shows you how to do your macros, how to do your diet. There's like a food exchange list. And these are all around, it's like $110 for like a program and a diet. And I think it's a really great place for somebody to start. Um, there's a lot of coaches online that do uh, challenges in that. And I don't know anything about them. So I wouldn't recommend And Normally I wouldn't recommend these challenges, but I do think it's a very good start for somebody to see what does training look like? What does a diet look like? It's not super strict. There's an exchange list. Um, I just think it's a great place for somebody to start. If you're willing to like, you don't want to just jump in with a coach because, um, you know, most coaches are wanting to work with you four to six months, at least at a time. And hopefully you don't always have to pay that, but it's a huge investment if you're not quite sure and you just want to get started on your own. And then you have the whole support of this community. It's like over 20,000, mostly women in this group. Nicole even responds. There's a lot of really great questions. It's such a snapshot of like, if you went out on the street and just gathered a hundred people, you know, you might have somebody who's like me, who's like been training for a while and kind of knows something. You might have somebody like Brooke, who's a pro, but then you've got mostly regular people who are just trying to learn about tra training and diet and get healthy and that type of thing. So I just want to plug that. No, and I mean, I didn't tell Nicole I was going to do this or she doesn't know or anything, but I, she's starting a challenge on the 27th and you can only buy, buy the challenges when they're you know like just before they're getting started and then it'll be like this one I think is 40 days so I just want to put that out there if somebody's looking for a good starting point or just kind of want to see like even if you don't actually do the challenge it's a really really I think a great investment to get your feet <clears throat> wet and kind of get some direction yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think if you are not maybe set, maybe you are sold on the idea of competing, but you have never done it before. Maybe a challenge like that is very beneficial for you just to see if, if it's something that you can stick with. You know, uh, I don't think that there's anything wrong with setting short term goals and just seeing if it's something that you could do. Um, because when it comes to competition prep, obviously it's a lot longer and it's very strict. So setting a, sh a short term goal, whether it's like a six week challenge or whatever the case may be, if you're able to stick with that and you feel good and you feel like that you enjoyed that process, maybe something a little bit longer, like a competition prep down the road would be something that you would be able to do. Um, and obviously, I think if you do want to compete, you have to enjoy the process. So 
if you don't enjoy maybe a six week little challenge, I don't think maybe a long 16 week, 20 week um, competition diet will be ideal because <laughs> there's going to be times where it's terrible. Yeah. I, I mean, I've had women who've signed up with me and then two months into it are just like, you know, this is not what I expected, <laughs> you know? And it's like, I don't expect you to follow everything to a T, especially if you're just learning, but also there, like, then you don't want to check in because you have, like, you don't want that accountability because you, you're like, oh, I only trained three days this week and I'm on a five day plan. Okay. Well then maybe we have to train, change you to a three day plan, but then you have to understand that you're not going to really be progressing very quickly. So like you said, there's a lot of monotony involved and, um, you know, in the building process from one week to the next, you don't see a lot of change, but you have to continue to do those check-ins, even though it's like, okay, you did great. We keep everything the same because that's what this is. That's what that's what we're teaching you is basically this monotony, not like, oh my gosh, I lost five pounds this week. Like that doesn't happen like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. You know, I often tell people if it sounds like it's too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. So these people that are saying, oh, I lost 10 pounds in one week and you still see, I don't know what those magazines are, but I mean, they still exist. It's like, you'll drop 25 pounds in 25 days, you know, I'm like, oh my gosh, but people fall for that, you know, and from like a, a marketing standpoint, I guess it's great, <laughs> but you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. And I think uh, you have to be very realistic with yourself, you know? So if you were just starting this journey, maybe training five days a week isn't ideal for you and that's okay start small scale, start with something that you can do that you can implement into your routine and you can do it successful. You know, you can do it without having any major issues. Don't stress yourself out. You know, then once you get to the point where maybe that three day routine is becoming easy for you and you don't feel like you're having any issues, you're just doing it. Then maybe you can implement that fourth day and build off of that versus just going all out 110%, all gas, no breaks. And I commend that kind of uh, thought process, but that's not ideal, especially if you haven't been doing something like that long-term or ever, you know, do something that you can stick with because consistency is what's going to get you your, your end goal. Um, it's going to get the, you the results that you want. So just focus on that consistency. And if you're only able to do three days a week at, from the get-go, that's okay. You can build off of that. Um, nothing's permanent. So I think you just have to have that kind of mind frame and, be very, very realistic with yourself and your goals. What can you do? How much time can you devote to training? Um, I understand their life is busy. People have jobs that require a lot of hours of them. People have families and, and children, husbands, things of that sort. So just be realistic with yourself. And what can you do at this given moment? How much time can you devote to this kind of lifestyle? Yeah, I mean, burnout is not sustainable. You know what I mean? Like you're gonna be, if you're, you don't like so many, the reason why people say like diets don't work is because they do a diet and then they go off the diet, you know? So that, that's not the mindset that you want to have. And even if you did like some sort of a challenge like this, like you can adjust to do three days, but you know what five days looks like. You can, like you said, Brooke, you can do three days. And then if that's working out well for you for a couple of months and you can add a fourth day, or you can add a fifth day you get to decide when you're stepping on the gas pedal and when you're stepping on the brakes. And I mean, this is what we all do on a regular basis. It's like things in life happen and you know what, I guess I can't train today. It's not going to work out. So now I have to, you know, do it tomorrow. And this is more me. That's like in, in more of a lifestyle phase of my life and not a prep phase of my life, but you have to learn to adjust to, you know, the obstacles that life throws you without just giving up, which is, I think what a lot of people do because it's very, very all or nothing. So, and to, to talk about your, the magazines, you know, so, I mean, weight loss isn't fat loss and you want to lose fat. You don't want to lose weight because weight is water or 
unfortunately it's, you know, that lean tissue that you're working so hard to hold on to. So if it happens quickly, your body is like, oh my gosh, like something traumatic is happening. Let's get rid of the, you know, the weight that's on us that um, is hardest to sustain. And that's the muscle. That's what's going to be lost first. So um, yeah, you definitely want to take your time. I think that's kind of the theme of this whole thing is <laughs> take your, take your time. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, we just live a fast paced lifestyle and, you know, I kind of had said it, mentioned it earlier. We want immediate results right then with little work, you know, and I get it. Who doesn't want that? I mean, I do too, (laughs) but that's just not how it's going to go. It's that is not going to happen. So that goes back to, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is, you know, um, it, it gets boring. We've said it multiple times throughout this podcast. It does get boring. You do the same things over and over again, but that's that's what's going to create the, the progress that you want. And you will be so happy if you just stick with it as well. Um, and here's the thing, the time's going to pass anyways, right? Four weeks from now is going to be four weeks. Four years from now is going to be four years. So you can choose what you do with that time, you know, because we all have that time. We just have to decide what we're going to do with it. Yeah. It's so true. Um, one of the things that I was going to say, um, oh, part of the beauty of, so, you know, it, like we talked about, it's, it sucks how social media presents, can present it like it's really easy or it's really quick. But the other beauty of, you know, social media and the internet is that you have all these people providing a lot of great information so that you don't have to make the mistakes like the mistakes I made or the mistakes that you made at the very beginning. Um, Because if I did compete now, I would know so much more than when I, (laughs) when I did it the first time. And so I think this is kind of what we're like warning people against. It's like, you can do it right the first time. Like you have an opportunity to do it right the first time and it may, it might not happen as soon as, you know, yours or my experience, like a lot of us had. Um, I know, I mean, I personally, I started lifting in 2010, um, and I didn't step on stage until 2014. So I did put in a pretty good amount of, (laughs) I give myself a little, (laughs) a little bit of credit, But, you know, I've done so many interviews where girls will just be like, oh, you know, they're already kind of lean anyways because of a sport or whatever. And they did just step on stage and, you know, looked okay. But this is also where genetics come into play. And you can see kind of who the people are who it's like, oh, they got away with that because they had good genetics and then they were building off that. And that's why they're a pro in the industry now, you know. It, it is, it's very person dependent, you know what I mean? So that kind of goes back to like the idea of seeing what is your foundation at right now? You know, there, there's people that might be able to step on stage quicker than others, purely based off of the fact of genetics. Maybe they have played sports all of their life. So they have some sort of background there that will help them and it will benefit them from a, um, a competition standpoint. And then if there's somebody that you just like the idea of competing and you've seen these like the the glamour of it on social media and you see these girls and they look phenomenal, but yet you've maybe never worked out a day in your life. It's probably going to take you a little time. Um, And it depends on what you look like at this given moment. Are you, are you very thin? Are you very heavy? Do you have a lot of body fat to lose? You know, those are all things that you have to kind of take into consideration prior to even dabbling with the idea of, okay, this is the show that I want to compete at, you know? Um, but it is everything in this world is person dependent. So I think you have to be realistic with yourself and you can only compare yourself to yourself, not somebody else, not your favorite pro on Instagram. Um, that's something to kind of talk about too. Your, your favorite pro on Instagram as well. They maybe look incredible right now, but their first show, they probably didn't look like that. I assure you. <laughs> so 
just because you want to get on stage and you want to look like uh, Nicole Wilkins, you know, she didn't always look like that, you know, you have to go back and these, these pros and they the thing that I love about social media is most of these pros, they post their journeys. So you can scroll through their social media and see where they started. And that, that puts things into perspective that they didn't start being number one. It wasn't like they went and they did their first show and they're like, this person is just so phenomenal. We need to get them on the pro stage. You know, it, it took them years to, to earn that pro status. And then once they earn that, it probably could have taken them years to make it to, to the Olympia, you know? So just be mindful of that. It is, it's a long journey. It's, you have to be very, very patient, but it's, it's so worth it. Um, it, it is absolutely worth it. Well, it's, it's worth it to just take that step. Like this is my encouragement and, you know, I want to give people accolades for, you know, you don't have to be a competitive bodybuilder, like we said, to be in this lifestyle and it's going to be, it's actually healthier, right? I mean, we, we can honestly say that it is healthier to be treading that line of competing rather than going to competing and then back into building and competing and building. It's, and you have to be healthy in all those other aspects, like somebody like you, Brooke, who is very disciplined. This is why you can, you know, maintain a good level of body fat in the off season, but not too heavy and still look good and all those things. This, you're on that other level and that's not most people, but anybody can be going to the gym, implementing progressive overload in their training, learning how to eat healthy 75% of the time, having a healthy food relationship. Like this is possible for anybody. Now, what the outcome will look like on your body is absolutely person dependent. It doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, look like Brooke or look like Nicole Wilkins or, you know, me or whatever it is. Um, but you can figure out what is best for you and what level you can, you know, your body can look like, and you can always be working in different ways to, to better that. I, one of the things that I love doing, and I think, you know, Brooke, you're the same type of person. I mean, I'll get women who, you know, they message me about wanting to compete. I ask them to fill out my assessment form and then I go over everything and just, this is me evaluating you, where you are, what you can be doing, um, you know, whether we're going to be working together or not. I'm going to honestly tell you an assessment of you. And I know you're going to do the same thing because you can't just say like, oh, you're 40, you should do figure. Oh, you're 20, you should do bikini. It's like, I need to know your food relationships, what you've been doing, you know, what you're capable of doing, what your life allows you to do, um, all those things, and just kind of assess where you are right now to get you into a direction that you want to go. But um, find somebody who will give you an honest opinion that is personal about where you are and the direction that you need to go. So then you you kind of know where to start from, you know, I think that's really important. Yeah, you know, and, and just like you said, go to somebody that will give you an honest opinion. Um, your your friends and your family, they're great and they're super supportive. But just because your your mom says you should have won the show doesn't mean you should have won the show, you know. And, and I and I say that in the nicest way possible. Um, it, this is it's a sport that you are literally going on stage to get judged based off of how you look. Um, so go to somebody that knows what they're talking about and they're going to give you honest feedback uh, and, and don't take it personal. I don't ever take anything personal because the, the individual, if they are being honest with you, they're doing it in a very genuine, kind way because they want you to be successful. Um, and if this is something that you truly are considering, they want to help you. Right. So if they tell you that maybe you need some time or you have an excessive amount of body fat to lose before or whatever the case may be you know, don't take it personal, um, but go to somebody that you do value their opinion, but they are going to give you the God's honest truth in, in that regard as well. Because if you do want to compete, you want somebody that's going to tell you how it is. That way you'll be successful, you know, and, and I don't care who you are. Everybody wants to have a good experience. That journey wants to be, they, you want a good journey to talk about because 
you're going to remember that journey. You know, whether you do one show and you're done or you continue to do it because you love it, you are going to remember that process and that journey. So, so make sure that you're going to somebody that's going to help you be successful in the long run. Yeah, 100%. Um, I wanted to just quick, I wanted to quickly touch on this. I felt like this is a good episode to talk about this quickly. So I have had, um, quite a few people ask like, Oh, do you think you'll ever compete again <laughs> Like to me? And I, I just wanted to address this because I, um, I had the most wonderful experience the first time I stepped on stage. And to me, I, I'm not somebody who's like, Oh, I love competing. You know, that's not what I, I like going to the gym. I like food. I don't really like dieting. I'm not a happy, <laughs> I'm not a happy um, person when I'm in a deficit. Um, it makes me very tired. Um, you know, I have a very physical job, those types of things. So with my current lifestyle, it just doesn't really work out. I just don't think that I could duplicate or top my first experience. And so um, even though, um, and I don't even know now if I would say, um, you know, the goal with bodybuilding is to look better every time you step on stage. And I think if I had maybe done that in 2017, when I was getting ready to do a show, and then it just it didn't work out, I wasn't going to be lean enough. And we had a family vacation um, to Mexico that was going to be like right after that show. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to stay on track with things. So you know, I just kind of went into an, an improvement season. Then I had a bunch of injuries and, um, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's different for everybody. I know a lot of women who are my age who want to compete. And I feel like there is, I don't want to say, I don't want to say there's a danger, but it's a lot more risky when you're older because, you can, I mean, I know women who are in their forties who've competed and now all of a sudden menopause has come earlier to them than what they've expected. Like dieting at a later stage in life to that extreme can be problematic and you have to accept the risk that comes with that just to, you know, do this goal. So I think getting into a lifestyle that's healthy and makes you happy is going to make you happy in the long run. Um, and you have to always assume the risk when you decide that you want to compete. For me, I spent the last couple of years really trying to get a healthy relationship with food, which I really feel like I have. And I don't want to mess that up either. Um, so I don't want to do anything extreme like that. But um, it sucks because I think like I know so much more now. I probably could do so much better. But like I said, the, the cost benefit to me is just so wide that I, it just, it's not worth it to me. I just want to be mm -hmm. healthy and, um, enjoy my life and continue to be involved in the sport and support other women doing it. And I know that sounds a little bit negative just because, but I, I, I know enough women who have, um, I'm not saying it wasn't worth it, but you do assume risks with things when you're competing, um, at an older age. So. Yeah. You know, and I don't think that there's anything wrong with making that statement. I think you should always weigh out the pros and cons with just about anything that you are deciding to do in life. Um, and bodybuilding is included in that. So what, what are your goals at the end of the day? What are your expectations out of bodybuilding? Um, weigh out the pros and cons, talk to different people that have been in the industry and have competed themselves, you know, get their feedback. Would they recommend it? Why wouldn't they recommend it? You know, what are the things they enjoy? What are the things that they didn't enjoy? Those are all things that should be taken into consideration when you're deciding on whether you should compete or not. Um, I, I do want to touch base off of the, the, the age thing and going back to like just the different opportunities that you do have. Um, there's, the industry has offered so many new classes and divisions it, it, each and every year. It seems like there's something new that's catered to anybody at this point, you know? So no matter what you look like, how old you are, uh, there's an option for you out there to compete. So if you are older, you know, and this is something that you're dead set on doing, there's, there's divisions that are called like 
true novice masters 35 and up true novice masters 40 and up and the list goes on um so and what that means is your true novice is going to be you're a first time competitor so if you were in that true novice masters division you are going to be on stage with first time competitors that are within your your age group you know so if you're kind of intimidated with the idea of being on stage with some some young 20 year olds and then go ahead and step on stage at the master's uh, division. I'll tell you, it's it's really inspiring for me to see those women on stage and they look incredible. Um, but it's nice for you. It's less intimidating to be on stage with somebody that's, they're a first timer as well. You know what I mean? And they, they're within your, your age group too. So that's an option. And you don't have to do that. But, you know, I think for some people, age, they get worried that maybe they, they won't do as well. They won't be as competitive. So there's something out there for everybody. And it, like I said, it seems like each and every year they're implementing something new. Um, so seriously, anybody can compete at this point. Yes. And I, I do love that. It's probably one of my favorite parts about the shows is you see these, you know, 65 year old women, um, you know, 75, 80, 90 year old. I mean, I, I was at, I think it was at Pittsburgh, um, it was the teen masters and they had like some guy who was like, you know, 80, late eighties or something stepping up there. And, and it's absolutely incredible. So yes, I don't want to discourage anyone in any way from, from that, but yes, you should rail way up the risks and, and it wouldn't be my first time. So, I mean, I, like I said, I already had my great experience. Who knows, maybe 20 years from now, I'll be like, screw it I'm gonna do it again <laughs> who knows but um yeah there is so many great divisions and those masters divisions are very inspiring it, it to to everybody who's watching so yeah it's absolutely incredible yeah um well Brooke I feel like I was gonna say something else but I don't remember I don't remember what any final <laughs> words um you know I just want to always tell people it's an investment um and don't be afraid to invest in yourself um it, it takes time but I will say the the sport itself is very expensive so don't cut corners and what I mean by that is yeah it sucks to dish out money for a spray tan or money for your hair and makeup or money for your suit all of those things but if you are going to truthfully put in the hard work and you're going to diet yourself down and do the crazy amounts of cardio that you have to do and spend hours in the gym posing, paying for a coach, paying for a posing coach, all of those things, make, make sure you are spending the money. Um, and if you're not at a point right now financially where you can do that, still maybe get in the gym and, and focus on your eating and things of that sort that you can do at this given moment and maybe save up until you are able to kind of afford to compete because it's it's such a special day and you see people all the time that step on stage and again they have killer physiques and maybe they cut corners and they had somebody do their own tan and it shows and then you step on stage and you did your own hair and makeup and if you are not familiar with stage hair and makeup it's something totally different you know and I understand it's it can be expensive but it shows again on stage if you kind of cut that corner um same thing with suit selection. If your suit doesn't fit you, it doesn't have to be the most bedazzled suit on stage by any means, but if the fit is not there, um, that obviously shows. So make sure you kind of think about those things and you take those into consideration as well prior to competing, because those are all things that can truthfully make or break you on stage. And at the end of the day, it is about the person that is presenting the overall best package on stage. So those are all things that you have to be mindful of whenever you do decide to compete. Yeah, that's a, it's like such a good point. That was actually one of my points is that you should have about $3,000 to invest in this prep time. And that, I mean, I don't even know, I mean, you've got, you've got coaching for, um, and, and this is the other thing too, like you should be working with a coach prior to going into contest prep because a coach, <laughs> let's, let's, let's touch a little bit on coaching. A coach has to know how your body responds to, uh, to a deficit, to a surplus, to like, you ideally want to have a coach that has 
been with you through all these, you know, it's kind of like getting married, right? Like you want to know that person before you have the wedding day, <laughs> like right. all these things. So, um, yeah. So like, you don't just like, if you hire a coach, like I want to do a show and I mean, remember we used to think it was like 12 weeks or 14 weeks for a prep. Like that was, <laughs> I literally see people post and they're like 33 weeks out. I'm like, oh Jesus, that gives me anxiety. You know, I'm like, I better not do prep at 33 weeks out. Because <laughs> that's like, I think, I don't know, 33 weeks out from Olympia right now. I'm in prep. <laughs> I would have a meltdown. I know. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. Missy, Missy <laughs> just got to always post how many days out she is from the next one, even though you know, she's not like in a deficit. She's just counting. Yeah. She's all in, man. She is. And in, she's intense. Okay. <laughs> you but know. you know, coaching, coaching is so, so important. And, and to be honest, I think a lot of coaches are very um, honest. If you come to them and you're like, Hey, I want to compete at this show. It's in eight weeks. <laughs> a coach is probably going to be like, you know, it, it obviously, depending on where you're at at that given moment, they they may take you on. But most coaches, if you're not in a point where you need to be, they probably don't want to take you on. And it's because I don't know what a person's going to respond to in particular things at eight weeks out. So we haven't been working together. And the longer that you work together with somebody, the, the more that you're both going to be in tune with one another, you know, and that is just like you said, it is like, like a marriage it's a relationship, you know, and you have, you build this trust with one another. And I mean, you have to allow a coach an opportunity to get to know your physique and know what you're going to respond to. And that's from a nutrition standpoint. That's from a training standpoint, a, a coach is there to help you through those things. So that's an investment in itself. Um, and I personally would recommend having a coach in season and off season. You know, I have my coach there um, nonstop. <laughs> like it doesn't matter because I need that accountability and I need somebody to help guide me in the right direction. And, you know, he's, he's leading the way and I'm following his plan to a T and what he tells me to do, I'm going to do. So I think it's very important as a competitor that you have a coach. If this is something that you're really truthfully considering doing, the longer that you have that coach, the the better off that you're going to be. Yeah. And I mean, we all know that like these winning physiques are built in the off season The the prep part is just the pace that you're going to be dropping body fat. And, you know, a good coach is going to be adjusting your training volume for you as needed, making sure basically the goal is to be able to recover and stay on track and, you know, adhere to everything. So it'll be like, you know, you'll be increasing cardio um, probably, but trying to figure out how to make sure you get your training in the minimum amount possible in order to maintain your muscle and, um, you know, and then slowly be decreasing your calories. So it's a, it's a whole, it's a whole harmony of things that are happening, but it's to keep the muscle and get the body fat off. This is not a building time. It's, it's a revealing time. And then you're going to, you know, you'll go into your, your rebound and try to get calories up to maintenance pretty quickly afterwards, but not, you know, over the top, like yeah. you had said before. And you know, and then it takes three or four months before your body is um, normal again to be actually in a good building spot. Like hormones have to get back to normal, hunger levels have to get back to normal. Like it's a whole, it's a whole thing. So it's it's a huge investment financially, physically, emotionally, which is why we call it a lifestyle because whether you're competing or not you're always in some sort of phase, you know, of it. And, you know, get, get into it. Like you said, like find a way to, you know, start learning about it and implementing different areas into your life. What I love about just about everything, once you know something, you can't unknow it and it really does become a part of you. So 
once you start learning how to train, once you start learning, you know, how to eat in order to be as healthy as possible, you always know that. So when you're putting Oreos in your face, you're like, oh, I know I shouldn't be doing this, or this isn't aligned with my goals. And maybe that's okay. Or maybe it's what I want to do right now. But you can't unknow that, you know, that that's probably not going to be best for you. So all these things, I just, I think knowledge is power. And with this, you can do as much or as little um, with it as you want, you know? Absolutely. And you can always educate yourself. Um, there's there's so many resources now. I mean, there truthfully are. There's podcasts, obviously, that you can listen to and, and watch. The, the internet is a... I mean, it's a great tool. Obviously, sometimes it's detrimental, <laughs> but you know, there's there's tons of resources out there and people out there that can help lead you in the right direction. Um, so take it upon yourself to educate. You know, set yourself up for success. And there's always more things that you can learn. I constantly am learning things on a on a daily basis. Um, but I love it. I think that's what I also love about it is because I am constantly learning new things um, and trying to soak and absorb everything that I can that this universe is going to allow me to have. I want, I want it all. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of it too, it comes down to the, the more, you know, the less stress you're going to be. Um, and, and stress is huge. So you need to make sure, especially from like a physique standpoint, the more stressed you are, the worse you're going to look. So if you can monitor those things and control your stress levels, do it, you know, and that all comes down to, again, educating yourself, making sure that you're one step ahead at all times, know what you're doing, have somebody that's helping guide you in the right direction. But just because you have a coach or somebody that is helping you take it upon yourself to, to do the research as well. You know, um, there's no reason come like show day that you don't know what kind of division, you don't know what division you're supposed to be in because you just let your coach do that. You know what I mean? You guys need to make sure that you're always on the the same page. And I know that sounds crazy, but it, it happens, you know, so have somebody that's going to help you, but do your research. Yeah, I do. Yeah, it is. It's all in your hands as much or as little as what you want to, um, how far you want to go with this or what you want to do with it. So um, yeah. And finding a coach that's going to help you is super important. Uh, I mean, coaches have coaches, so it's, you know, everybody, if you want to get somewhere and you have a goal, then you're going to have to have somebody leading you. So, yeah. So much. That was such a good <laughs> What's that? <laughs> that was such a good quote. Like we need to put that on a t-shirt. I don't even know what I said. <laughs> You have to go back and look. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. Oh, you know what I was going to say? One of my favorite quotes was I heard, I don't, Renee Jewett said it um, when she was talking. Oh, it was on one of her posts. Um, I don't remember somebody, I think somebody trolled, said something trolly, you know? Um, like, what are you going to do when you don't look like this, or I don't know what it was. And she said that, she said, I know that bodybuilding has a shelf life. And I was just like, <laughs> I feel like um, there's like all levels, like your life is constantly changing. You know, I know, like, I don't do certain, th <sighs> this Facebook post came up on my, um, you know how Facebook has like their, your memories. <laughs> it was like from 2013. And it was like seven plates on the leg press. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't, I don't even do three. Like, plates. Right, yeah. <laughs> oh, I was like, yeah, I'm like, oh my gosh. But also like, I think this is the beauty of how like the information that's out there and how we have evolved. It, there's a lot of training um, smarter and not harder. So you can make less weight be more by slowing it down. It's less detrimental to your joints. That's what I think about with my old training, because, you know, you think about, oh, I got to move this weight from point A to point B. And you're not thinking about connecting with the muscle. So like I could do half the weight that I did, you know, when I first was training and get a lot more out of it because I'm training smarter, um, not harder, but 
that bodybuilding has a shelf life. I think that about competing, you know what I mean? Like hard competing um, has a time, but before that is, you know, when you're learning and, and then afterwards is when you're adjusting into your lifestyle and, you know, every decade is kind of a different phase. And so you can always implement it. Um, so I don't know. Yeah. So that was a couple of random things, but I just, um, <laughs> like <random. laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm, okay. <laughs> So how, how are things going for you, Brooke? Things are going good. You know, um, I'm just over here doing the same things day in and day out <laughs> every single day. <laughs> but I mean, I, I truthfully love what I do and I enjoy it. So I definitely bite off more than I can chew on a daily basis. And it stresses me out more and more each and every day, but I do it to myself and I, I do genuinely enjoy it. You know, I love the sport of bodybuilding and I obviously love the sport, like just the fitness industry and in general. So talking, I could talk about it for days and hours, you know, it's, it's what I do. So it just, it, it gives me so much joy and I just truthfully hope that it gives others just as much joy as it gives me. Yeah. This is why this is why we have so much excitement because it has been life changing mm -hmm. once you make it a part of your life. You know what I mean? It's just yeah. Yeah, I agree. So are you you do a lot of like expediting and you travel to different shows? Do you have anything uh, like that coming up? Yeah, so the season's about to kick off. Um I will start well I start traveling again at the end of this month. So I can't even believe it, but I'm, I'm ready. In, in all honesty, I feel like I've kind of been a little bit stagnant because I haven't done anything all year. I mean, we've done a few like posing workshops and things of that sort, but I'm ready for these shows to start. Um, expediting is something that I, I truthfully enjoy because it gives me another perspective of the sport. Um, I obviously enjoy competing. I enjoy being a spectator at these events, but whenever you're working these events, it's just a different dynamic and it stresses me out too, because I want everything to run smooth for, for the competitors, you know, because if it's not running smooth for them, it's probably something that I've done, you know, and I want them to have the best experience possible. So I think I've told you this before. I truthfully, I get more nervous expediting shows than I do competing, <laughs> you know, but I enjoy it and I'll start traveling. I think my first show is in um, Iowa right? It's Des Moines. And then I go to South Dakota. Then I go to St. Louis with St. Louis Pro. So <clears throat> I'm looking forward to it. I can't, I cannot wait. And I can't even believe that it. it's like here this year has already been like flying by. So bring it on. <laughs> so exciting. And do you find it easy to stay on track with everything? Do you, when you travel, are you gone for like, how many days are you gone for then? Usually I'm gone anywhere from Thursday to Sunday or Friday to, to Sunday, depending on the size of the show. But if I'm just being honest, it's actually a lot easier for me to stay on track when I'm gone. I'm The weekends are my biggest struggle, you know, because that's when I have a little bit more freedom. Um, so I'll just be bored and think, oh, I'm bored. What shall I eat? You know, and that's not the case. I, you should not eat anything just because you're bored. It's not time to eat. So whenever I'm out working these events, it's easy for me because I'm staying so busy. I'll focus on, I won't even realize, hey, okay, it's time to eat, you know, because I've been busy. But the downfall is if I'm on stage working an event, I'm on stage all day. So I might get behind on meals or I might get behind on water. So I try to adjust kind of as needed. So I'll drink as much water as possible prior to prejudging. And then I'll go to the bathroom and then I'm going to hold you know, I'm not going to go to the bathroom until after pre is over and I'll combine meals on those days. So that's what I have to do. So yeah, I do have to make some adjustments, but it's easier for me to actually stay on track because I'm just so busy. Yeah. That, that's like very common with just people in general is that they fall apart on the weekend because, you know, they're not at work for eight hours a day or something like that. So I don't know. I think it's very important. To, to try to keep yourself busy on those days. So if you're somebody that struggles whenever you have like um, <clears throat> free time and you're just bored and I, that person, I try to keep myself preoccupied 
in, on other things and just being productive, whether it's like <clears throat> household chores or whatever the case may be. That way I'm not like uh, shoving my face like with a bag of trail mix. <laughs> so that's something I would do. <laughs> do, you, do you still have a, you still have an eating plan right now? Are you like, but are you um, like still like, are you snacking on things that you're not tracking? <laughs> You know, what is crazy is this, it, it seems like each and every year that passes on, I get more and more serious. Um, and not to say that I haven't ever been at a hundred percent because I think I have been at a hundred percent every single time that I'm like focusing on a contest prep or an off season, but it's funny, your hundred percent varies because I'm finding things that I'm like, okay, I can be a little bit more disciplined here than where I have been in the past. So my plan, I mean, I'm, I'm truthfully eating so much food at this given moment, but I am on track to a T. Um, and it makes me super, super proud of myself because I actually don't have the desire to really snack on anything. And I talk about trail mix and trail mix is something that like I have struggled with for years. And I know that's so funny to say, but I'm not kidding. I'm truthfully not kidding. And I just, I haven't even had trail mix, you know? Um, I eat my meals according to my plan that Matt has given me. And I'm so on track. I'm just so, so excited. Um, and I do have free meals, you know, and, and I'll have like an occasional drink or something like that. But this is the most disciplined and the most serious I've ever been in an off season. So we've got a plan and we're implementing it. Going for, <laughs> you're going for number one. I mean, you got to, yeah. you got to do all the things, you know, Absolutely. I would, I would say, I know it's like too late now because like the um, spring shows are coming up, but I would always recommend a spring show because um, that's when all the Easter candy is out. So you can have Easter candy when you're done. <laughs> you know, that's funny to say that because I um, have always used to do like I've done the St. Louis Pro numerous times, right? And it, they always used to have it on Easter weekend. And I kid you not, I remember at being done with that show and eating those like Cadbury, like the small little soft shell chocolate eggs. Oh my gosh. That was like tradition. After I got done with St. Louis, Pro, I'd go eat some of those eggs. <laughs> yeah. Delicious. Yeah. I love mm. Easter. I love Easter candy so, so much. Uh, I did. So my first show was in... Um, yeah, it was the same. It was like April. Um, I think it was, it was April. And I remember like at the end of the night, like I was so, t we went to like a Chili's or something. And my, my meal was like, not, it was like subpar. It was very not satisfying, which was so disappointing. <laughs> but I had like this whole box of like Easter candy that I had gotten from Walgreens. And I was laying in bed, like with a giant Reese's egg and I just was like, I'm too tired to eat this, but I'm going to eat it anyways because <laughs> Cause that's what needs I think to I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> Literally after your show, you're in bed, just eyes closed, just eating food because you can. Yeah. Yeah. But you're so tired because the whole, I mean, you've been up since like three o'clock in the morning for your tan and whatnot. So bad. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it is. <laughs> We should talk, we'll do another one and we'll talk about like show day or something like that. I know we've done that before, but, um, ah. and I, I've advertised these other podcasts on social media because they're still relevant and it was like such good information. They're still the most downloaded, um, podcasts ah. the ones that you and I have done about competition prep. So, um, I mean, everybody wants to know, everybody wants to get into it in some way or another and, I don't want to discourage anybody from doing it, but it, having all the information, you've said this so many times throughout the podcast, that knowledge is power. And, you know, you just want to know as much as you can so that you don't have fears, you don't have questions, you don't have unknowns when you're going into it. And you can be confident, confident in your picking your show, confident in what you're doing, confident in your coach, um, all those things. Yes. And the only way that it happens is by knowing as much as you can know about it, you know? Yeah. You know, that's, again, that's setting yourself up for success and knowing anything and everything that you could possibly know. That's, that's the good and the bad, you know, with life, there's, there's great things in life. There's going to be bad things in life too. So, um, 
you should always know that the, the good and the bad, the pros and the cons. And the more you know that the better off you're going to be just in general. So I think these podcasts are very, very good for people, even just coming down to like personal experience. You know, we've all made mistakes. I've made countless mistakes from a co competition standpoint. Um, and it's nice whenever you hear these things from other people, because you're like, you know what? That's a valid point. You know, you have never really thought about something like that. Um, so I think these are just great tools for people to listen to. Um, you know what? There's, there's something that I do want to touch on that I, um, I was, I just made me think of this. Um, I have had so many, okay, this is such a touchy subject, but I just want to say you should not be, you should not be implementing any type of performance enhancing drugs on your first show. <laughs> I oh, one thousand percent. Yes, yeah. and I have had way too many women who have, like, I think they just think, oh, I just, I just tried some this, that, or whatever, and it's like this is like such a serious thing to get into, and something that you have to graduate to. There's just, I could really say you know, unless you're somebody who has been training hard for a long period of time and you have really tapped out your training and your muscular potential and you've never stepped on stage, then I could maybe see that this is your next step, but that's when it is your next step. And so just because you're going to compete does not mean that it's time for you to implement drugs, especially if you Yes, you said it perfectly. You never want to even dabble with the idea of that until you have completely maxed out your potential. Um, so if this is something that you've never done before, and if there's somebody that's telling you this long list of things that you should be doing, by all means, fire them, you know, because you have got to go as far as you possibly can first all natural um before you ever dabble with the idea of, of crossing that line um it, and even then it's not something that you want to put like a whole long list of things you know be smart be absolutely smart think about this as a whole you have your health for the rest of your life once you start to kind of do those particular things you're really walking a fine line um and there's the risk is the risk is already going to be elevated at that point. So go as far as you can all natural. I, I think that, that that's such a, such a great argument and a valid point. I wish so many people would really be mindful of that. Yeah. And if you're hiring a coach and you say you want to do prep and it's your first prep or it may be even a coach should be evaluating you where you are. And I, I just don't think that there should be, um, you know, the coach isn't even the one that should be bringing up, you know, the drugs it's you or should be asking, am I at this place? And then they can evaluate that. And, um, we, I've had a couple of episodes that I've done with Jamie Pinder and we've talked about the, you know, how to, how people, not how to implement drugs, but some more of the stages of which that happens. And I think that's a good listen as well. Those have been very popular episodes as well, because people need to know, you know, when you're implementing um, compounds, it's one at a time. It's like anything, like if your doctor tells you that you're sick and gives you five different medications to take, that doesn't even make sense. You know, you have to see how one is re you're responding to one and what's happening. So um, if a coach is saying, hey, you need to take all these things in order to do a prep and you've never done a prep before, I, you're definitely are. This is the wrong coach. And even if somebody reputable had recommended that coaches can say different things to different people. So they might be a great coach for one person. And if that's the experience you have with that person, you can either say, you know, hey, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't want to do that. One of the things that Jamie talked about mm -hmm. too is establishing those rules and that boundary at the beginning of your prep and not succumbing to the idea of it being presented later when you are compromised. Because if you're in a state of you're tired, you're, you're hungry, you're 
very, very lean. Hormones are kind of out of whack. You're, you're compromised. This is a time where you might cave and say, you know, they might even say, Hey, this is going to help you place better. This is going to help you do better, but you need to be in a full good state of mind to be making that decision. And you don't even know if this is something that you like, or if it's something that you're going to need to do. There's no sense in taking that risk for, you know, a what if at this point. Absolutely. You're, you're never going to make life-changing money, (laughs) you know, in this sport. So that's, um, you know, the first issue, but (laughs) No, that goes back to whenever you're you're choosing a coach, that you need to have a conversation with this individual, whoever you're thinking about selecting as your coach and and talk to them, whether you're able to do an in-person consultation or maybe a phone consultation and, and set those guidelines. Um, a coach is there to help you, yes, and maybe that they can give you some advice on, on things that maybe that you should do or maybe implement at some point, but it's also their job to make sure that you have a life after bodybuilding. And so if a coach is not going to be mindful of your health, that should be a major, major red flag to you. Um, And this is the thing I have used my coaches as examples for my entire life. And the coaches that I had when I was 12 years old, they cared about the person that I was outside of my, my training or whatever my sport was at that given moment. So they cared about the brook outside of that sport. And I have carried over that idea to this day. So whenever I had spoken to Matt, you know, about our, about his coaching prior to ever selecting him as a coach, those are things that I wanted to go over and I wanted to address that way when it came down to it, he wasn't going to be in a position where he felt okay telling me to do something when I had already spoken to him and told him that those are things that I'm not willing to do. Um, if you set those boundaries and those guidelines right from the very get go, there shouldn't be an issue. And you know as well whether you're going to mesh well with somebody or not. And it's completely okay not to mesh with somebody. We have people that you're kind of like, ah, I'm not really feeling this vibe with this p- particular person. That's okay. So I encourage every competitor um, to to reach out and speak to these coaches prior to ever selecting them, just to see if you think that it's going to be a good good fit for you, you know, because if not, you don't want to have to spend the money and the time and the effort with that particular person when you could have been spending it with another person that is going to be more on the same page as you. Yeah. You know, and like, so and performance enhancing drugs are not like, I speak of this as though I'm like this, like person who knows all about drugs, but I'm not, but I, (laughs) but it's not like, like, uh, you know, cocaine or something where people are like, oh, I tried it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, these are drugs that you need to be using for a cycle and um, with proper training and proper nutrition, you know, because I mean, we all know of the people who who use performance enhancing drugs who don't look like it because they don't implement proper training and proper nutrition. So it's, it's an, in addition to, um, you know, and even in prep, the only thing that you're doing is just, it's helping you hold on to that muscle that you would be pop probably dieting away. So, um, you know, I mean, I'm not going to get into, this is not going to be like a whole drug thing, but I, I want people to understand, like, you don't just like try Anavar for two weeks or, you know, and expect like, you know, like it's like Superman or something like that. You know, that's not what it's, that's not what you're not going to get anything out of that, except maybe some side effects that you don't want to have. If you use something you're not supposed to be using. So, yeah. That's so valid. And again, there's risks assumed with any performance enhancing drug. So uh, you have to be mindful of that. And some you will assume more risk than others, but there are risks. So if again, and I've heard this numerous times from people that have said, oh, there's, there's no side effects of this. Yes, there are. (laughs) Now it could be person dependent and people might respond well and others not so much, but absolutely when you decide to cross that line, you are assuming another risk. So just be mindful of that. Absolutely be mindful. Yeah. So yeah, that was one other thing that I wanted to talk about. Cause like I said, I've known too many women who 
uh, they just kind of dabble, you know, because of boyfriends or, you know, people at the gym or whatever it is. Um, and, um, yeah, there's a lot of risk involved and I think you have to, you know, you graduate to that like anything else. So, you know, get involved in bodybuilding, start lifting, start working on your diet, go to a show, all the things that we talked about, see if you love it and see how much of this you want to be a part of your life, because there's, there's room for some aspect of it for everybody, especially somebody who, you know, a woman who wants to be strong and become more confident and better herself. Um, and I know even like Melissa and I talked about the last podcast talking about how bodybuilding just kind of bleeds into every aspect of your life. So I think that there's such a, a good, healthy, um, I think bodybuilding and learning how to do this is very healthy and it will better you because it's a discipline that will bleed into all aspects of your life. Yeah. Gosh, you're like on it with the quotes. That's a good one. <laughs> <It's> so funny. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this is what we love about it. You know, it's bettered all areas of our lives and um, yeah. Yeah, it's just great. We just want to encourage women to be strong and healthy and confident. And this is such a good route to get on in order to become that. So, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> well, Brooke, it's always a pleasure. I'm so thankful that you were able to make time. And it wasn't the end of the day. So I was all tired. <laughs> I know. Look, we look vibrant. I don't know. I don't know if I look vibrant. I don't have like a lot of lashes on one eye, you know, I, I got to get my lashes filled. My hair's kind of crazy. Totally fine. Good. It's all good. All right. Any, <laughs> any last words? What do you want to say? Any last things? Did we miss anything? I think we nailed it. Yeah. We nailed it. We nailed it. That's yeah. just this is like, Brooke is like my hype girl. I need, everybody needs a Brooke <laughs> in your life. There we go. Heck yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, if you guys are looking for coaching or um, an evaluation or assessment or anything like that, um, you can find Brooke on Instagram at Walker Brooke, right? Correct. Yep. Yes. Um, that's probably the best way to get a hold of you. Is it not? It is definitely the best way. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And um, you can follow the podcast at the women's fittest um, on Instagram or anywhere you listen to podcasts. This video will be up on my YouTube at buffcake22. And you can find me on Instagram at buffcake22. And I'm happy to always give you an assessment. If anybody wants to get a hold of me, you can email me, et cetera, et cetera. And remember that healthy looks different on everybody. Thank you, Brooke. <laughs> Thank you. See you soon. See you soon.